Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, exciting panel discussion on blockchain in energy sector. I'm Saptarshi Chaudhary, the Director of Emerging Technology for Paramount Software Solutions. And today I have with me some interesting people who are going to share their insights on uh, how blockchain is impacting the power sector and the whole world of energy. And uh, I'll request the panelists to give a snapshot of their profile, uh, starting from Joss. Yeah, so uh, good morning, good evening. My name is Joss Rerling. Um, I'm a distinguished architect certified by the Open Group, uh, working in uh, the uh, Global Competence Center for Energies, Environment and Utilities at IBM. And I'm the uh, global CTO for blockchain solutions in that industry sector. Um, so, and, and uh, yeah, that's uh, um, basically um, the track record. Later on, I will share some of the projects that I've done. So uh, almost 20 uh, of which uh, I think a dozen, I can, I can share how we move forward. Um, and uh, I think we uh, also uh, will address a little bit um, a very interesting uh, uh, success story that we have implemented using Hyperledge Fabric. Thanks, Joss. That was uh, really exciting. And uh, I'd request Veronica. Uh, so good morning to everyone or good evening, whatever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Veronica Garcia. I'm the CEO and founder of BitLumens, uh, where uh, we work with um, IoT and mainly smart metering devices uh, that we had actually designed and manufactured. And we connected to uh, blockchain technology for two different um, use cases. One of them is for carbon tokenization and the other one is for uh, to give the end user, mainly the person that it's uh, consuming electricity with a financial track record. So we basically uh, work with renewable power plants in rural communities and we bring uh, our meters in there and, and, and deploy them and, and connect them to the, to the blockchain. So that's what we are doing. Uh, thanks, Veronica. Uh, Ravi? Uh, Ravi, I guess you are muted. Okay, we can go to Preeti. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, this is Preeti Kumari working as a blockchain researcher and architect at Paramount Software Solutions. And at Paramount Software Solutions, we are working on a few blockchain energy uh, sector projects. Some of them including peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform, then uh, carbon con uh, consumption uh, trading uh, tracking. And uh, apart from these, uh, I am on the walls of completion of my PhD. And I'm very excited about cutting edge technologies, whether it is AI, ML, big data, IoT, or quantum computing. And I'm really looking forward how these technologies are going to fit with blockchain. Yeah, that's all. Uh, thanks, Preeti. And, uh... Ravi, can you unmute yourself, or I guess uh, we will move ahead. OK, so I guess we can move to, like today we are talking about blockchain in the energy sector. So what's so special about blockchain, and uh, how does it relate with the energy sector? Uh, I would like uh, Joss to you know share your thought first, and I'll request the other panelists to follow ahead. Yeah, so thank you. Um, uh, so and, and I think that this, uh, the image that's on the screen now since the start um, is my way of uh, visualizing what's happening in the energy sector. So you see in uh, more and more regions that uh, deregulation is going on, uh, creating unbundled markets. So the traditionally vertically integrated are being all different kind of companies. And uh, the last, um, I think, five years, the energy transition is very high on the agenda, uh, driven by um, the renewable generation, which is more distributed, um, new way of collaboration, like virtual power plants, new microgrid solutions. Um, and it gives uh, a new dynamic in our ecosystem. And it, uh, it, it basically uh, asks for multi-stakeholder collaborations 
uh, which which are come with very complex problems and i think the fit with uh, with the blockchain uh, pattern is very very elegantly as it addresses um, those collaborations in ecosystems uh, with which you can build um, uh, intelligent workflows uh, connecting all the different uh, players that are needing to collaborate in order to get the uh, optimum uh, customer experience that we all want to have uh, combined with the reliability that we are used to especially in uh, in, in the in, in Europe and other parts in um, in the world uh, for a very reliable um, uh, electricity supply as we are becoming more and more depending on electricity for our uh, in our day-to-day -day lives Thanks, yeah, I would like Jock. to jump in there to um, you know to to describe a few of these very interesting use cases uh, digging into the points that Josh just uh, mentioned. Uh, for instance, the National Energy uh, Commission in Chile uh, deployed in, I believe was in 2018, uh, a platform where they would enter their data uh, on, on Ethereum blockchain. And they did this because they wanted to trace data and share it across different stakeholders in the power sector. Um, in particular, they were interested on, on, on security, right? How they can provide better security and transparency of this, of this data and, and try to uh, be mindful of hacking attacks. Uh, and for that, they were using the, the public blockchain. Uh, the other aspects that I think are, are quite interesting are the digitalization of, of the energy sector, right? And there, as Josh said, there are many players that are, are actually um, having very specific actions in this sector. Like, for instance, when it comes to IoT, smart metering devices, um, the transmission system operator, the EV vehicles that are coming into play, and then how you can actually provide better solutions for decentralized energy systems where each household can be a node that feeds the grid. Right? And for that, there is a very interesting uh, project here in Switzerland uh, where there is the, the, the TSO is when, of course, the balance of, of supply and demand of these particular aggregators, meaning the households that have uh, batteries at home and whenever you have your battery charge and you want to fit the grid you can do that creating uh, contracts that are in the blockchain right uh, so I do believe that these use cases are are going to be uh, quite interesting to see to analyze and and also to to find collaborations across different countries Well, I appreciate those insights. And uh, Preeti, what do you think about that? Uh, Preeti, I guess your screen is raised. Can you hear us, Preeti? OK, so maybe we can move to the next part of our discussion. And that is about, you know, successful case studies so veronica you shared some insights and preeti uh, i mean joss has shared some of the insights i want to know uh, according to you what are the successful case studies that you have encountered so far based on your uh, you know implementation of different blockchain projects in the energy sector so joss i would like you to take a lead you mentioned about 20 projects so i want you to start and maybe veronica can take it from there Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, Hello. so my experience is that uh, most utilities no, no, no. want to have the, uh, the innovative uh, solutions that will bring them to the front page of all international newspapers. But those use cases are very, very hard to find, um, mm -hmm. and it's very um, uh, unlikely that those use cases will be successful, given that small uh, corporations in the energy industry are quite risk reverse. So that is quite a challenge on, on itself. Um, the second uh, part of, uh, of use cases are those use cases that uh, will improve current running processes. And there, um, uh, there is a very hard business case to make uh, to, uh, to implement new technology. So what the su most successful projects are, uh, in my experience, is those 
those use cases that augment the current operations or open up new markets or those kinds of operations. And I can show a list here of my, uh, my, my personal project dashboard. Um, uh, so uh, I, and you see that um, we have a, a, a six-phase approach to identify what, uh, what the different use case uh, um, is uh, in regard to adoption. So uh, identification and technical feasibilities, building a demonstrator, building a minimal viable product uh, to go into the market and then scale until uh, the minimal viable ecosystem where all the financial accelerators start to kick in and everyone is uh, is making benefit and then go to market scale. So, and here's a list of, uh, of use cases. So, um, and, um, uh, where you see, uh, I think, uh, three uh, major projects. So the first one is grid balancing. Uh, I will uh, talk about it um, a, a little bit later on, uh, but that's an, a new innovative way of solving some of the issues with renewable energy. Um, uh, so, and the the, um, uh, the third one is uh, supply selection at public charging poles, uh, which is on the back of um, a new EU regulation that uh, demands uh, multiple suppliers to be concurrently delivering energy at your doorstep. So that's a quite new uh, um, uh, requirement that all the utilities need to implement. Um, so, and the other highlight uh, that I want to highlight is uh, building energy management. That's a flex platform uh, uh, that we have built for the city of Copenhagen. And that's now uh, being um, uh, destined to go to market scale as well. Um, so, and, and here I think I'll stop a little bit and ask uh, for uh, Veronica to, uh, to chime in before I um, uh, dive into uh, the, the first project in a little bit more detail, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you, Josh. You know, I think it's, it's uh, as I mentioned it before, it's extremely important to view these use cases and, and understand also some of the regulatory constraints and the constraints on the technology itself, right, that before we bring these to market. So I'll, I'll talk about these challenges uh, a little bit later too, but I think it's very, very important to, to understand them to really be successful in, in a project. Um, so to us, one of the very important uh, use cases that we have seen is um, how we can actually tokenize uh, carbon. And for that, Hyperledger has an amazing group. Uh, it's it's open source that they are being, um, you know, working very very hard since uh, I think years now on 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 this. And what they basically do is they run the calculation of uh, let's say a, a carbon offset or or a renewable energy certificate on chain. So we are doing pretty much the same. We are running it. On, on Hyperledger Fabric 2.2. And then later on, we can tokenize it using layer two type of Ethereum, you know, like XDAI. Um, and then of course, this has to be somehow certified and brought into the, into the marketplace. Uh, for that, we are taking a slightly different approach where, where we try to certify it after the calculation takes place. And, and this will, of course, be, uh, we will be able to really understand what are the, the emissions on different entities uh, in the power sector. Right? And then this will open the door to additional use cases, mainly on the um, financial uh, side of things, where you, for instance, could have an issue a bond on chain, which usually is, is cheaper, according to HSBC at least, and then later on, you can have the coupon paid on these uh, carbon uh, credits, right? So, which could be quite interesting since the carbon market is, uh, or, or the price of carbon is increasing. And, and that's at least what we are betting in the future. So these are some of the additional use cases that, that I see that at least in the European Union, they are being uh, deployed. Um, with a lot of potential to additional uh, additional use cases, in particular in the sovereign debt market, where you can bring additional liquidity to this type of uh, financial instruments to really reduce carbon emissions over time. Uh, I would like to add a few use cases to uh, 
what Veronica already mentioned over there. So as she also already mentioned about the financial transactions. So blockchain can provide instant payment settlement. So usually mm -hmm. nowadays what happens, it takes around 60 to 80 days for the compensation of whoever the selling the energy over there. And for small businesses, it is very important if they get, get instant payment settlement over there. And we can do it using smart contracts very well. Apart from this, if we consider, apart from this, if we consider about uh, security, then uh, auditing, then uh, since all the data or transactions are recorded on blockchain in chronological order, so whoever goes for the auditing, it is very uh, instant for them and they can do it very easily, the auditing purpose. That is not going to take a long time as it is taking as of now. So these are some important use cases I can think of. Thanks, uh, Preeti. Appreciate that. And in, interesting insights. You guys are actually merging the different verticals, the power sector, and then you are bringing the uh, financial sector, and you are trying to build and create some kind of resilience in this. That's really nice insights. And Joss, you have actually demonstrated out of the many different projects, there were three different projects which were maybe in a large uh, scalability you are looking for some degree of large scale implementation so if you may share a little bit of insights on those uh, you know projects that looks to scale or that are in wide scale implementation yeah so so and i want to uh, share a little um, different perspective and some detail on all the projects so all the projects that listed here are run on hyperledger fabric so okay. and there is no there is no cryptocurrency involved in either of them so what we what we implement and do is to make an um, uh, a separate layer of uh, building those uh, multi-party uh, workflows uh, possible and uh, do not uh, combine it with the uh, with the cryptocurrency and uh, and financial transactions so, and um, one of the reasons to do it is uh, um, the energy industry is heavily regulated, as we all know. So, um, uh, it's quite uh, elegant to use a permission blockchain like Fabric. Um, and it has uh, huge benefits to, to the sector. And uh, especially in, uh, in the first one, where we are uh, almost uh, building and running. Uh, a real-time operation yeah so the finality of the transactions is below two seconds and that's a very um, uh, crucial capability of uh, of fabric that we leverage um, that that makes that use case um, uh, yeah available and and fly and for instance the third one uh, is a, a spin-off of an uh, disaggregate billing uh, case that we have implemented um, and on the disaggregate billing, uh, it, it, the case is that if you can split the uh, kilowatt hour uh, that is consumed by different devices and can allocate it to the correct account, you can then accommodate different uh, contracts and different pricing schemes uh, for the different um, usage of, your, of the electricity. To make it very concrete, so if you uh, uh, own a company, if you drive a company-owned car, and you charge it at home, um, then you, you charge it on your retail contract. Um, and the retail contract usually have different price points than uh, wholesale contracts for companies B2B. So, and with this uh, disaggregate billing solution, you can then allocate the kilowatt hours consumed by your vehicle um, uh, to the corporate account uh, and subtract it from the, from the total amount recorded by your smart meter. So um, you only pay for in your uh, um, uh, retail contract the actual use of your of your home, and and that's of interest of um, uh, of a fleet owner because they can then uh, uh, purchase the energy cheaper than they will uh, do in the current situations where they compensate you financially. So there, uh, the co corporation is paying wholesale uh, retail prices for a, for a wholesale energy consumption. Um, so, and uh, now we are um, implementing it at 2,000 public charging stations in the Netherlands, uh, where you can select your own supplier when you show up at the public charging station. And the same uh, mechanisms apply. Um, and also new retailers that uh, are stepping into this uh, new capability 
find themselves um, uh, in in a different market that they don't uh, sell sell energy to uh, fixed home connections but they can sell you energy when you're on the go on charging stations that support this capability so they see new offerings and new revenue streams uh, coming in so and then uh, you know is, is it that time to go a deep dive on uh, on the, oh. the, the master project I think we can go into that. Absolutely. These are really fascinating facts. And we have got Ravi back with us right now. And I think we can hear him now. It looks, uh, you know, again, thanks again, okay. Ravi. Hi, Ravi. Thank yeah. you. Thank Let's hope you guys hear me now. I could hear yes. and everybody now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK. So uh, what I would like to know further is you have mentioned about that Hyperledger fabric fits very well with a regulated environment. When we go to implement a project in, let's say, for any public sector utility companies which are highly regulated or any kind of environment which is regulated, can you share more insights? What are those traits of Hyperledger fabric that are actually favorable for any kind of uh, utilities to think about or give priority uh, while taking their decision on a blockchain? Oh, yeah. So I think that there are a number of arguments that are resonating in the sector. So one, if you run the Hyperledger Fabric, which is a permission blockchain, um, then you can have very lightweight consensus algorithms. And that means that your CPU footprint, your energy footprint to running the blockchain is very, very low. Yeah, so we run these blockchains in a handful of Intel servers. Right. So and you can run it on, on cloud, you can run it on premise, you can run it, uh, yeah, whatever the case may be. Uh, and we also have implemented uh, hybrid multi cloud solutions. So one entity runs it on Azure, the other entity runs it on IBM cloud, the other entity runs it on premise and it builds a, a, a total uh, blockchain for that for that use case. So and um, so giving the very low uh, energy footprint is is a must. Um, the second one is that uh, the, the lightweight consensus algorithms allows you to have very fast finality of transactions. Um, and third and not least is that if there are no uh, cryptocurrencies used to compensate the miners or, or actors in the network, because it's not necessary because the, the infrastructure is so lightweight, uh, your transaction costs are not influenced by trading of uh, cryptocurrencies. So your, your business case runs on a very predictable transaction cost. Yeah, so that's, that's the third reason why I think uh, the fabric one is a very elegant one to use in, in this industry. Thanks, uh, yeah, we, we have a few more points over here. So with fabric, uh, uh, now we get an option of using fabric private chain code. Uh, that is not production ready yet, but we can run smart contracts inside Intel SGX and Clay. And that makes it a very secure environment. And even if you want to go for any bidding, then we can also use uh, this confidentiality framework, fabric private chain code, because whatever the data uh, will be provided in the system, that won't be visible to anyone, not even the auctioneer or not even the any administrator and all. And uh, apart from this, as uh, Joss already mentioned, like uh, the TPS uh, transaction per second. So Fabric has a higher uh, TPS than any other uh, existing frameworks. Uh, as of. Uh, thanks, Preeti. I'll uh, get back to you on the question on the security of blockchain. But I would like to hear from Veronica her thoughts. And then we will move on to the next segment. So Veronica, over to you. Um, yeah, so, you know, we started in, in uh, 2018 using um, uh, Ethereum, actually, um, Ethereum public blockchain. And what we understood, you know, we were we were using it to pay for the electricity bills, basically, of solar home systems. And what we understand fairly quickly was that, you know, even though we didn't need the transaction to be immediate, uh, the gas that you needed was still fairly high and therefore the, the financial cost was just uh, too high. So therefore, I, I completely agree with Josh and, and Priti. We, I mean, we we run that use case and we decided to, to move to a Hyperledger Fabric, which is extremely easy to use, it's plug and play, and then it's it's cheap when it comes to, you know, um, the, the operational side. 
of things. And on top of it, you can also, you know, using uh, different hyperledger platforms, you can also run smart contracts and have, I think it's called uh, FPC uh, chain code, where you can wrap these smart contracts in a way that you have an enclave, right? So you don't have, you, you, you don't need to share uh, information. You just understand that that information and that data is there. So it's really private and different um, actors can actually um, work together in such platform without knowing, uh, you know, let's say uh, uh, very particular details on a patent, for instance. Um, so this, I think all these different uh, features are fantastic. So okay. adding one more point to it. Uh, so though there is not a particular cryptocurrency in the system, but Hyperledger Fabric supports fungible as well as non-fungible tokens in terms of yeah. ERC-20 and ERC-721. So we get a pretty good tokenization system over here. Yeah, uh, Hyperledger brings a very versatile and collaborative platform all together, and it has uh, it covers all the segment of uh, registry, uh, bidding, and then you know clearance. Settle maybe you can take it in a other uh, level, right, in the bank level or ne next offline as well. But uh, Hyperledger gives you end to end. I have a follow up question now, Preeti. You raised a very interesting point on the security. So do you think blockchain can offer or add any layer of security to the existing uh, power sector? Because you know, quite often we hear that there are some issues or challenges with cybersecurity hacks or uh, potential you know, hacking activities that might impact the greed, the overall greed or the operation of the power sector as a whole. So any thoughts on that? Uh, definitely, I think so. Uh, because blockchain is secure by design. So how it is secure? It is immutable. Hash of one block is getting added to another block. And if anybody tries to change, make changes to any of the blocks, it is going to reflect on the whole blockchain. And apart from that, it is distributed in nature. So there, there won't be a single computer who will be making change in the blockchain. Whatever goes on the blockchain, that needs the consensus among all the organizations or participants. And apart from that, everybody needs to have an identity to, uh, to sign any, digitally sign any transaction over there or to perform any uh, process or any, uh, to call any chain code function over there, to execute any transaction over there. And if I talk about in the energy sector, so the for smart grids, they smart grid relies mainly upon automation and remote access. So in that case, authorization and authentic authentication becomes a prominent issue for them. And if we put smart grids, just a use case on the blockchain, we can solve this problem of authorization or authentication both all together. Because whoever will be doing any transaction over there, first the blockchain will check whether they have a perfect uh, identity with them or not. They have whether they have got that identity from a certified authority or not. And then we can access uh, use access control mechanism using smart contract. So whatever the functions they are trying to control, because whatever the data goes on the blockchain, that goes through only through the smart contract function. So we can put access control with the smart contract and we can check like whether the person who is uh, trying to perform this uh, action, whether they are authorized to do that or not. And uh, since uh, if we go for a permission blockchain network, since all the participants are known to each other. So if anybody tries to perform any malfunction over there, it is easily trackable and they are trying to they are under the impression that okay persons know me here so i don't want to uh, create any bad impression of them i want to continue business with them so i have to perform this uh, legal set of actions or this these procedures such that our business can uh, run so i think sure. blockchain uh, will put up pressure and uh, uh, the everything in place such that uh, security pro uh, process practices can also go fairly okay. well. 
those are uh, you know excellent insights now i would like maybe jaws to take a lead privacy and security go hand in hand so preeti addressed the immutability the distributed nature about uh, i guess certificate authorities and other things from a privacy standpoint because if we talk about businesses like regulated entities many of the data points need to be private how does hyperledger or blockchain as a whole can facilitate and support the ecosystem in the regard with regards to privacy yeah so the, there are a number of solution patterns that are available right so uh, creating channels uh, will will guarantee the first layer of defense for commercial privacy so that your transactions are not shown to other parties in the ecosystem so it's not only that uh, what Piri was discussing that you want to uh, understand um, uh, and hide the, the the details of the transaction, but uh, even transaction Sakashi, volumes sorry. between. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, I okay. I don't think I was hearing anything. Josh, are you there? Yeah, I'm yeah, still here. We are here. We can hear you, Veronica. No, no, yeah, no. But I don't hear Josh. Hear uh, sorry. Uh, can we can hear, hear Josh. Can yeah, I can hear you, Josh. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. so I yes. j j go ahead, Joss. I'll, I'll, I'll we'll continue, right? So, yeah, so, so, um, so it's not only that you want to uh, protect the, the transaction details between parties because that's confidential, uh, but uh, only uh, even the, the volume of transactions and the time of day when those transactions occur gives insight into your competitive environment. So I think that's a very uh, elegant solution to use channels to shield that uh, that uh, uh, that aspect as well. Yeah. So there are an, uh, quite a number of layers uh, that are available. Um, so and uh, last but not least, um, uh, we recently uh, acquired the patent uh, for zero knowledge proof, so that you even uh, prevent the data from entering the blockchain. Uh, but uh, using zero knowledge proof gives the, um, uh, the recipient the trust that the actual delivery in the real uh, real environment uh, is still uh, uh, trustworthy. Yeah, and that that's a lead into into my um, my other use case if I can. In uh, addition yes. to what Josh uh, just said, I would like to just mention one private data collection over there. Uh, so. With channels, we get a set of uh, private nodes, and inside that channel, we can implement private data collection. So uh, the parties who are interacting or who are interested, such that a price only uh, price we want to hide from other organizations or other participants, right? So we can keep price between two organizations itself, and we can store that price in a private database. And a hash of that pri uh, price will go on the blockchain. And later on, if we want to check that price, whether that has been altered or not, we can check that because uh, a corresponding hash is stored on the blockchain. So we can make sure that the data stored on in the private database has not been changed, as well as it is not visible to any other parties as well. And one okay. more point is that fabric uh, private code uh, that we already discussed. I appreciate uh, the wonderful inputs. Just to make sure we are 33 minutes uh, now, and I'll encourage anybody, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot your questions in the chat so that we can respond to those. And now we wish to go to the next segment of our discussion, and that is covering the challenges. I'll request uh, Ravi, a question for you. What is holding back blockchain from a global adoption? We hear about blockchain from the year 2009, uh, we hear about the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading maybe from 2016, and now we have many POCs and pilots, but when it comes to real production-grade deployment, uh, which is a large-scale implementation, I think we are still lagging behind. So Ravi, I would like you to take the lead here, and then I'll encourage Veronica and uh, Joss and Preeti to share their thoughts on it. So over oh, to you, Ravi. You. Yeah, thank you. I hope you guys hear me now. Right. So yeah. what I could see uh, predominantly, right, um, uh, it's a market maturity standpoint because uh, blockchain-based any offering is a team play. 
you need to have an ecosystem coming in there are two kinds of an ecosystem one is your peer play right for example if you go for uh, uh, demand response or uh, you know demand response management system or der coming into play right you have uh, you know um, uh, whole set of uh, distributed energy coming into play where you have to uh, bring in those into uh, so, you know connected in three layers right one is device level connection then you have a uh, managing those set of device and connected to uh, you know uh, registries and uh, bid management system or trading system then finally settlement right so i could see there are uh, iot's and related stuff is bit matured but the derms or other related stuff is getting matured that is one uh, you know because uh, they are coming up in the uh, in that space you know uh, and the same time the adaptation towards the ecosystem plays uh, you know the uh, uh, private plays aggregators uh, you know or overall that are all getting formed or still in the very nascent stage right and uh, this has to form as a ecosystem or a consortium to jointly see and there is a core Uh, thing is coming is ICT that you no know, um, ICT players like you no know, um, communication providers right they have a core play in it and they are yet to start that play because I could see a technonic shift from cloud and ICT players may take over over a period of time as a smart you know energy system as a service providers later in because it will give lot of uh low cost offerings or you know uh, market barrier entries and all that so this is my point of view it's all a very interested and you know the poc pilots taken care only on blockchain centric on that you know it's a combination of drm and that has to happen a larger piece and it has to move along with ict plays also that is a later lie you know later i could see and beyond that has to bring in other consortium players uh, players you know sellers buyers and you know consumers so i think there is there is quite a bit job to be done in that space it's my view Excellent. yeah I, uh, i i i i completely agree with ravi in that respect um and and i will add an additional point to that that i mentioned at the very beginning the digitalization of the energy sector in different countries is completely different right uh and and this is extremely important to um to mention because for instance how do you do peer to peer trading if you don't have a smart meter in place right so then you you first need to have the infrastructure available you need to have the regulation available to implement this type of use cases and therefore we are very very interested to to really deploy the the technology we have in india because we have seen that the level of digitalization in the indian market is wonderful right you guys have adhar since ages now you have the upi um so it's really i think it's it's ripe and i do believe that one thing that that it's missing that i have not seen it's a let's call it a global sandbox to really adopt this kind of use cases mainly for research purposes and really to understand what what are the frictions in the system right so so i think regulation it's really key uh and and just to give you an idea the regulation we have to comply with when it comes to the smart meter itself it's huge right you need certain certifications certain certifications then then oh. i don't know yeah. what was that some kind of uh, <laughs> network glitches yeah go ahead yes yeah. yeah so then the second piece that i want to mention is that if you move from the iot and the smart meter and devices into communication protocols in india for instance we have seen uh, that each state has a different communication or reg regulatory constraint for communications that need to comply with for instance lora technology or with radio frequency or whatever it is and if you cannot send data to the cloud or to the chain then you know that the use case is simply not there and the last part is really regulation on the the blockchain use cases that exist and interoperability of blockchains and for that we are very interested to see the work that hyperledger has done on cactus uh platform thanks uh, veronica i would Thank encourage joss to very take nice. a lead now uh that will be on consensus building like ravi mentioned there are diverse levels of uh, progress when it comes to the maturity of the different hack stacks 
Veronica mentioned there are different regulations in different countries. So when it comes to building a consensus among the different stakeholders, what could be the potential strategy or approach that we can think about which might help in the promotion of blockchain overall or adoption of blockchain in the power sector? Yes, yeah, so so thank you. So and and to chime in a little bit on what the uh, the other uh, parties uh, and uh, Veronica already mentioned, I think that uh, one of the crucial aspects is also the governance that we need to learn as an industry how to collaborate together, uh, because uh, one of the and uh, I'll, sh I'll, I'll just to show um, one screen, if just a second. So so this is this is my lighthouse project, right? So and. Um, uh, what, what's what's uh, um, shown here is that uh, once you want to collaborate between startups and uh, the uh, regulated uh, corporations, then the decision making in those uh, companies are quite different. Yeah. So uh, and also the speed of decision making. So uh, in order to um, uh, to make that work, uh, not only the regulation needs to be um, uh, in 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 shape. Yeah, so in this use case, for instance, we uh, we embark on the uh, harmonized European regulation. Uh, in North America, the regulation is coming up with, in, with the FERC 2222, which is opening opening up the market for the uh, same kind of use case. Um, but the collaboration between the different entities is uh, quite an aspect that we learned in, in this project, uh, which went live in 2006-17. Um, and we built a blockchain solution for each country and we replicate it for each country in Europe uh, in order to be uh, resilient to outages uh, in a single instance. So because it's novel uh, technology, there are quite a number of upgrades and, and new versions. Um, I, we don't want to have an, a full blackout in Europe based on an hyperledger fabric issue. So that's why we have a very um, uh, uh, well, uh, distributed approach. Um, so, and to Veronica's point, uh, connecting those blockchains um, is quite is quite a, a novel area that uh, that needs to be uh, tested out in the market. Uh, so, and if you have a single platform, then it's m probably a little bit uh, easier to do. Um, and and one of the uh, the project that I'm currently working on, and it's being uh, submitted in open source uh, on, on Hyperledger as well, is a, a new tokenization layer on top of Fabric. Um, so, and that means that uh, we can build now uh, a, a token-based solutions, um, uh, which has the promise, if you use the token taxonomy framework, uh, that you then can share uh, the, the, the token definitions have different implementations on different technology stacks, but uh, being able to do atomic swaps between those uh, different uh, blockchains in order to preserve the value and uh, support that uh, that use case and and the workflow between uh, between all the entities. So, and that's uh, something that we are uh, uh, collaborating with with two tokens dot uh, org in in the Netherlands, and we are building an implementation for a large client in Japan as we speak. Okay, those are quite vast insights and uh, appreciate all your combined collective inputs today. Uh, I would like to move to the next part, which is again a follow up to your points on tokens. Let's uh, cover a little bit about tokens. We hear a lot about NFTs picking up, you know, the market traction. People are very much interested and curious to learn what it is all about. And again, how does token influence the overall power sector or the energy ecosystem. So maybe again, I'll request Jaws to take the lead and then I'll encourage others to step in and share their thoughts. Yeah, so uh, so very briefly then. So, um, uh, so when you talk about tokens in the energy sector, everyone has a resemblance to tokenize the kilowatt hours. So, but if you look at the, um, the energy uh, transition issues, then financing the, the energy transition is quite an, uh, a complicated uh, task on itself. So currently we are, uh, I'm working on fractional ownership of uh, solar farms. So, and that means that uh, we're creating a FinTech product to, uh, to accelerate the, um, uh, the build out of new solar farms. Uh, um, so in interesting aspect is that if you have a fractional ownership, so for instance, a token representing a single solar panel, 
you can then hook the kilowatt hours and also the power for trading also the certificates of origin uh, that are applicable in certain markets as off takes of that single asset so and that gives a new dynamic on uh, on in in the industry i think yeah so uh, and and how it all turns out um, that's quite uh, interesting to to see uh, you can follow us on uh, on the two tokens uh, website uh, but uh, uh, there are work streams on uh, regulatory aspects, work streams on taxation aspects, work streams on uh, the technology aspects, so the IoT integration, the metering, um, uh, and, and also some, uh, some aspects on the business case. So how do you model the business, uh, mo uh, how to create business models for all parties in the ecosystem? Exciting. Any thoughts from anyone? So I think the fractional ownership that you mentioned is going to pick up a lot. Uh, may not be in all places, especially in the cities or where you have limited space, having a rooftop solar panel sometimes may not be feasible. Or in some other locations, there are some interesting projects going on where people are looking just to replicate the model of cloud, going into some kind of a solar farms and you give the ownership, uh, segregating need not be the whole, but dividing it into as much as uh, someone can afford. So I think that's something we can look into. Uh, the next part of our discussion that I would like to target is on carbon offset. We talk about a lot about climate change, global warming, COP26 happening in London this year, and many other events. So from a carbon offset registration, uh, I'd request uh, Veronica to share your thoughts, and maybe others can jump in after you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I think the the um, you know whenever it comes to carbon mitigation strategies and climate disclosure, uh, blockchain technologies provide a fantastic advantage when it comes to uh, the type of infrastructure that you can build, mainly for these climate disclosures and and to really connect each entity with their own carbon footprint. And if you go a step ahead of that you can also tokenize it meaning just to give you an example right now we have a smart meter we understand what is the consumption and the generation in a certain community uh, let's assume it's a rural community and they are connected to a solar uh, plant right we get all this information we run a calculation on the blockchain and, and hyperledger fabric 2.2 where we get um a type of uh, carbon offset or irec depending on the type of generation and capacity the power plant has right and then later on we will be able to tokenize that and sell it in the open market uh, of course, um, MRV has to happen. Of course, certification has to happen. Uh, but I think it's a fantastic use case to really understand and, and pinpoint who has mitigated what, uh, what over a certain period of time. And then later on, let's assume that a conglomerate of SMEs will get together and say, we want to issue a bond on the blockchain and let's say the coupon can be paid as i mentioned before either on fiat currency or it can be paid using this uh carbon credit so these are i think are really interesting use cases to uh move financing to the areas that are actually having an impact on the carbon footprint. thanks uh, veronica and uh, we have one question from Kartik. So some of the key issues that we have been discussing in the panel, why can we not just use existing conventional centralized IT application and architecture to address those and to drive efficiencies? Uh, not able sure. to see what the key point is that makes blockchain the best and potentially the only possible solution as opposed to existing IT systems. So what's the revolution? Ravi, you want to take a lead? Yeah, I take that. So see, um, blockchain and uh, similar emerging tech, right? AI, IoT, blockchain. Having said that, they bring in three buckets, uh, new market innovation and new uh, business stream and revenue stream. That is the 
major goal, right? Uh, all of a sudden, everybody puts a rooftop and they have a production of uh, you know uh, solar energy. Post consumption, they are putting it to a grid. We understand everything in place. Like we have a smart grid. Uh, even the low voltage have a, a smart facility to push it into you know grid, right? End of the day, you this cannot be done in a centralized place. This has to be done through a distributed way within, you know, consumer to consumer or business to consumer or business to business or business to business to consumer. All this complex system, you have to mitigate, come up with a model, business model and provide, you know, entire value chain, you know, uh, economic value and then financial transaction. This can be done a blockchain combination of asset transaction and financial service. That is one area and reorient of the market markets like some other area is new reorient like you remove disseminaries right in between that you know who are playing as a middle agent in this can be removed which cannot be done by a, you know other ledger systems or other you know, centralized system as of today uh, and efficiency is already you know always been given you know once you do this or uh, reorient your process and functionalities and all that it, it is taken care by the entire both of the market reorientation and the new business innovation definitely takes care of this set of functions so i see you know when you want to get into a new market new approach or existing re market reorientation blockchain as a federated system uh, ecosystem play uh, it, it it supports it and moreover blockchain is for the enterprises you know a new um, network based erp for ecosystem place to come and work as an you know uh, 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 to to address a common goal or you know achieve a uh, you know business scenario here that's my point of view so i get it you are referring to the decentralized environment is needed because for more competition in this market so so far it is centralized there is uh, i would say least competition in the market uh, we need more competition in energy sector such that consumer can get be better services and at affordable prices. That's why we need this center. And uh, if it becomes decentralized, then to acquire trust in the network, we need to go for with the blockchain. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. Okay, uh, Joss, I think you are also willing to respond to this question. Yeah, so I would add one uh, one new one aspect. I think that is not very uh, expressed so far, and it is traditional solutions uh, gives you visibility in your single hub to integrating with your upstream and downstream kind of collaborators. And as we see as the, for the, the transition in the ecosystem, so we need to have multi-stakeholder solutions. So when the blockchain gives you opportunity to see beyond your integration point with your supplier, uh, the total supply chain or the total downstream. So that gives more trust for every party, you know, because you have more visibility on the data that's flowing between parties that you're not aware of. You know? Okay, wonderful. Veronica, any thoughts from your end? I mean, to me, the, the important piece here is, you know, whenever you have IoT in place and you can connect it, let's say, to uh, the chain, and, and, and this could also be uh, on edge, the level of security you are including in the system, it's something that that it's very difficult to achieve with a centralized network. This is one. Uh, the second piece is, you know, traceability of data in our use case is extremely important, right? Because if you're working with rural communities and you want to bring investors on those rural communities, how do I provide the transparency they need to know that this data is actually there and that it has not been modified or, or whatever, right? And that these, act these users in rural communities do pay uh, for the electricity and their services. So I think, you know, that the transparency, not just for the investor, but also for the end user is really key. Uh, just to give you an example, the uh, in rural communities, usually they would pay for their electricity on a weekly basis. Um, but at the end of the payment period, let's say they have a solar installation at home, no one usually give these people with a certificate or with a receipt that they have actually paid for their, their loan, right? Because that's pretty much what it is. With this type of technology, you can actually facilitate that at the end of the payment period in an immediate basis, which is not something we have seen so far. So I do believe that immutability, verification, security of data and standardization is really key uh, 
at least in the energy sector. Thanks, Veronica. I guess we have a few more questions. I, uh, we can take one more question now here. Uh, I would like to take, as companies are struggling to meet the ROI with business use cases for blockchain projects, do you think they will be interested in using DLT for SDG? I assume this refers to sustainable development goals. What are the advantages for early adopters? Yeah, so I can chime mm -hmm. in a little bit. On I, that. I, I would uh, like to, to uh, take that question. So when it comes to uh, the ROI of businesses, right, uh, whenever you add transparency, you can uh, also add the fact that if you have, for instance, IoT and you have a smart meter that can allow you to get data uh, on a, on a, on a real-time basis and monitors the system on a real-time basis, you are for sure reducing your O&M costs, right? Because you're not sending uh, an agent to check on each house uh, who is consuming what. This is the first piece. And then if on top of that, you add blockchain technology to really standardize the data across different parties, I do think that um, increase of use cases will also, of course, provide an increase in revenue in the future for all these uh, companies. But it's, it's a mix. It's not only uh, blockchain. To me, it's the mix of technologies that really provide a very stable use case to reduce cost and increase revenues. And does. Yeah, so I, I think that um, uh, blockchain, successful blockchain projects have a clear uh, positive business case for each party to collaborate. So, and if we are looking to uh, sustainable development goals, you see that the ESG category three emissions, so the, the, the emissions that you have impacting uh, upstream and downstream of your own business activities, needs to have a collaboration the need that's a multi-party collaboration that you need to need to work in so you need to have then uh, a bounded context so everyone has its own data sets on how they're uh, producing and what the emissions are and partially needs to be shared as uh, as part of the, the normal business transactions they do in the value chain so i think that uh, the sustainable development goals with esg is a, is a very excellent use case. And that's uh, something that's uh, on the table uh, right now for me, for a big client in Japan to, uh, to find out uh, how we can use and apply blockchain and tokenization to make that a very elegant solution. I would like to add one point here. So for auditing, uh, usually we need to pay some third party and come on to auditing, right? But with blockchain, auditing can be done instantly. So that's gonna also add into ROI. And one more thing, as I already mentioned, the uh, uh, payment settlement uh, ha happens instantly with the blockchain. So what if you have to wait for payment for 60 to 80 days? And what if it happens instantly? So these are mm -hmm. all factors as the other participants already mentioned that is gonna affect ROI. Excellent points. And I guess we are just two minutes uh, to close up. First of all, I want to thank everyone for your time. Uh, those who have joined us today in this wonderful panel discussion, Joss, Veronica, Preeti, and Ravi, sharing your critical insights. And uh, I guess we will connect with you guys later as well. The Hyperledger Global Forum for today has just started. We are having many more events. We can connect with you guys. And for the follow-up questions for others, uh, I'll encourage you to maybe we can connect via the networking session or you can share, drop your mail ID here in the chat and uh, we will try to connect and try to get back to you with any questions that you might have. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for your time and uh, wish you a wonderful event ahead of the Hyperledger Global Forum 2021. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, all of you. Bye. Thank you, Alok. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Pretty. Thank you, Josh. Veronica and Pretty. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.